everybody and welcome to Chem Talk. Today we'll be talking about curved arrow notation, how to use it, and how it works. Curved arrow notation will be a very important device that you will need to use throughout organic chemistry that will help you follow, understand, and even predict organic reactions. For example, here we have drawn the Des Martin oxidation reaction. This reaction oxidizes alcohols to make them into aldehydes, ketones, or carboxylic acids. This reaction is super important in chemically synthesizing many drugs, vitamins, and fragrances. It looks really confusing and messy right now, but after understanding how curved arrow notation works and going through a few examples, hopefully it'll be a little clearer. So let's get right into it. When it comes to molecules and electrons, one of the most important rules is the octet rule. The octet rule states a maximum number of valence electrons possible for an atom to have, which is eight. And it might not sound important, but it is key to realize that it is possible for an atom to have fewer than an octet of electrons. In particular, some compounds contain atoms that are short of an octet by one or more electrons pairs. One example of this is boron trifluoride. Here the boron is electron deficient because it has six electrons, two from each bond, instead of eight. These compounds are called electron deficient compounds. We will be using these types of compounds to show how to use curved arrow notation because electron deficient compounds have a tendency to undergo chemical reactions that will complete their valence shell octets. In such reactions, an electron deficient compound reacts with a species that has one or more unshared valence electron pairs. For example, if boron trifluoride was reacted with a chloride ion. Here the chloride ion has an electron pair that it can use to bond with the electron deficient boron. So here is the donated electron pair. In such reactions, the electron deficient compound acts as a Lewis acid. A Lewis acid is a species that accepts an electron pair to form a new bond. The species that donates the electron pair to the Lewis acid to form a new bond is the Lewis base. So here, the boron trifluoride is the Lewis acid and the chloride ion is the Lewis base. So yes, acids and bases really never go away. As a result of the specific reaction, the boron has a completed octet now. Actually, the octet completing is a really big driving force of this reaction. Now comes the curved arrow notation. This is a really important symbolic notation that is used for keeping track of electron pairs in chemical reactions. The notation often describes the flow of electrons from an electron donor, a Lewis base, to the electron acceptor, a Lewis acid. So the electron flow is shown by the curved arrow drawn from the electron source to the electron acceptor. So if we go back to our original example of the chlorine ion and the boron trifluoride, we can redraw it like this. We can see the electrons in the chloride ion becoming the bond between the chloride and the boron. This reaction is an example of a Lewis acid-based association reaction because the reactants are combining to become a product. The reverse of this reaction is a kind of reaction called a Lewis acid-based dissociation reaction because the reactants, in this case the, the BF3Cl- minus, dissociate and become BF3 and Cl-. minus. So here we see that the BCl bond breaks in this reaction and this, the electron pair is transferred to the chlorine ion, or to, be, to be, make the chlorine ion. So then we end up with the BF3 and the chlorine ion. So lastly, let's keep in mind some rules. For each reaction where you use curved arrow notation, the sum of the charges on the reactants must equal the sum of the charges on the products, basically charges conserved. So if you look at our example, so here we have in the products, we have one negative charge on the boron, and in the reactants, we have one negative charge on the chlorine. So they're the same on both sides. Another really crucial thing to remember is that the arrow always goes from the electron source to the electron acceptor. So as we have drawn here from the, where the bond between the B and the Cl, the electrons there are going towards the chlorine to make the chlorine ion. In our original reactants, the electron pair from the chlorine is the source, and it's going towards the boron, which is the electron acceptor. This is essentially how to use curved arrow notation. Naturally, these reactions will get more and more complicated the, and there will be quite a few more rules, but this video introduces you with the idea behind the notation before you dive deep into the intricacies of organic chemistry. In more videos, we will get more into different types of reactions and more complicated electron movement, and then even more, this curved arrow notation will become even more crucial. So now let's do some examples. So as I said, now let's do a few examples. In problems like these, where we're trying to figure out the product, it's always important to figure out which molecule in the reactants is the donor and which is the acceptor. Here, the only um, atom with available lone pairs is the oxygen, so that'll be the donor. 
And as we saw before, the boron and boron trifluoride is electron deficient, so that'll be the acceptor. So the, an electron pair from the oxygen will bond with the boron on the boron trifluoride to create an, a bond between the oxygen and the boron, which will lead to this product. As we saw before, and we stated in our rules before, that the net charge on both sides has to be equal. So on the, in our reactants, we see that there's a zero net charge. In our products, we have a plus charge on the oxygen and a negative charge on the boron. Well, the positive and the negative make a net charge of zero, so there's a net zero charge on both sides. Perfect. Now again, let's do the second question. Here, we can see again that the oxygen is the only atom with available lone pair, so that'll be our donor. And the CH, there's a CH plus all the way at the right side. Well, that's going to accept electrons. It's electron deficient. It wants to be, um, maintain a neutral charge. So an oxygen, a lone pair on the oxygen will donate electron pair to the carbon all the way at the end of the chain. So now this type of chain is going to become a cycle, a cycle. It's going to be circularized a little bit. If this product doesn't quite make sense, try to imagine the original reactant in the same formation, except just there being a gap between the um, oxygen and the carbon it's bonded to. So that'll make it uh, make a little more sense, because you can draw the original reactant in a circular manner as well. Again, we can see that there's a net plus one charge on both sides. First, there was a, on the reactants, there was a plus one charge on the carbon. And now on the products, there is a plus one charge on the oxygen, so a net plus one charge on both sides. Now for just a few more examples, and I encourage you to do these problems now by yourself if you can. Otherwise, I'll go through them in a second. So pause if you want to try them by yourself. Okay, so now let's do it together. So in this first question, we have to try to figure out again which one is the donor and which one is the acceptor. So the donor, it seems like the oxygen on the H2O seems like the likely donor with the electron pair that it can donate. And the central carbon on the left reactant seems like the ideal candidate for an acceptor because I have that plus one charge. So if we draw our curve arrow notation, we can draw um, the electron pair on, um, going to the carbon on the left reactant. So then the bond is made between the carbon and the oxygen, as we can see in our now product. Again, we can see that there's a net plus one charge on both sides. Originally, there was a plus one charge on the carbon, and now there's a plus one charge on the oxygen. We have to make sure that we maintain that um, equal charge on both sides. For this next question, instead of thinking about it as donor and acceptor, let's do Lewis acid and Lewis base. So if we remember, the Lewis base is the electro electron donor and the Lewis acid is electron acceptor. So here we can see that our Lewis acid will probably be the boron trifluoride because that boron is electron deficient as we've seen countless times. So the ammonium, the NH3, will be our Lewis base. And we can see this pretty easily too because the electron pair on that nitrogen seems a likely donor for this reaction. So if we draw our curve and arrow notation again, going from the electron pair on the nitrogen to the boron, we can see that a bond is made between the nitrogen and the boron, which will create our product, and that what we have drawn here as our product. Again, there was a zero, there was a zero net charge on our reactant, so there must be a zero net charge on our products. So if we think about it, the boron must have a negative charge because it is accepting electrons, and the nitrogen must have a plus one charge as it is donating electrons. So again, there's a net zero charge on both sides. With this video, um, that well, that concludes this video. I hope that now that you have a better understanding of curved arrow notation and how to use it, and going forward, you use it. We will use it regularly in all of our organic chemistry videos when it comes to alkanes, alkenes, alkynes, everything. It, our curved arrow notation is really, really important, especially because these reactions just, will just get more and more complicated.